Aloha and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode in our Relationship Skills Series. We are joined today by Dr. Kainoa Kaniakua and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can go over some of our slides. So this is gonna be our third episode in the Relationship Skills Series, a guide to healthy communication and conflict resolution. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kainoa Kaniakua. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist and will be guiding us through the different skills that we'll be learning throughout the weeks. Our first skill that we learned was learning to take breaks. You can see that in episode one. That was followed by look for a win-win scenario. Today's episode, we're gonna be discussing listening with as much intensity as you want to be listened to. And if you're planning on joining us next week, you're gonna be learning you are not a mind reader. So that's gonna be a fun one. If you have any questions about this series or wanna get any follow-up information, please contact us at info at mentalhealthhawaii.org or you can go see these other episodes of the series at mentalhealthhawaii.org. Our phone number is 808-521-1846 for Oahu. And if you're calling in from Maui County, it'll be 808-242-6461. We do have a Facebook account at Mental Health America of Hawaii and an Instagram account that's based on self-care that is at Live in the Net Owl. And if you are very active on Facebook, you can check out our Facebook groups, which involve the Busy Bees Kiki activities, our MHAH book club, and then our MHAH Maui page that's specific to all the events and trainings happening on Maui. We do want to have a little bit of a disclaimer before we get started. So the relationship skills series is not meant to be a substitute for any type of therapy. It's basically a series that's rooted in education that's going to be providing you with some information and it's going to encourage the facilitation of healthy communication skills and some conflict resolution skills for your relationships. If at any time during the series you start to feel unsafe, just know that there are some resources available. You of course can call us, but also if you're having symptoms that are making you feel very unsafe, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's at the 1-800-273-8255 or our crisis line here in Hawaii. That's 808-832-3100. If you're from Oahu, the neighbor islands toll-free number 1-800-753-6879. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kanye Akua. Our episode today is going to be talking about listening with as much intensity as you want to be listened to. So I know that for a lot of us, we feel like we're really great listeners. Um, and we're kind of wondering, like, what's this episode about? Like, how can I do that? What are some suggestions that you have about listening with intensity? Um, so it, it is if Kind of like how we were talking about last week with the win-win scenario when you go into something uh, when you want to uh, uh, share something that with your partner that you also understand that part of this is going to be that you're going to be listening as well because one-way communication is a speech it's like i'm just going to say what i'm going to say and then i'm done when it comes to communication it has to be that i am going to share with what i need to share with you of what i have to say and I'm sure that you're going to have some type of thing to say back to me or some type of reaction to it. So with as much as I want you to listen to me, I'm going to go into this with that intensity of wanting to listen to you and what you have to say. Absolutely. So I think that one of the things that when I was working with couples that would come up is this idea of listening also resulting in advice. What do you have to say to people who are concerned that when they start communicating with their partners or family members, that they're going to get a lot of unsolicited advice? It's very natural that that happens. Um, usually people will see a, uh, a problem and a problem needs a resolution is what mo clicks in most people's mind. When it comes to what are you looking for with your communication is um, have a conversation of about that with your partner. There might be some times where you just wanna talk about something, you just wanna to talk to say something and not necessarily need any type of resolution to it. You just need to talk about it. And so sometimes it can be, like there's often times I will um, consult with other like marriage or family therapists or other psychologists and I will ask, am I offering you solutions or advice or are you, am I more a sounding board where you need to speak out loud 
what you have to say and what you'd like to talk about. And then that way I know my role. If my role is more active listening, that's where I'm at. If my role is to actively listen and look for things that would be helpful suggestions and you know, that's what I do, but it's an agreement with the other person if that's what they're looking for. Because I'm pretty sure anyone who's been in a relationship has probably heard like, why don't you listen? Why do you always have to like make suggestions or try to tell me how to fix things? I don't want you to do that. I just want you to listen. Uh, so yeah, there has, it, not there has to be, but it would be helpful if there's an understanding of if I'm in solution mode with you or if I'm in more listening mode. I really like the idea of kind of prefacing conversations with what you need from them. I think it probably feels a little strange for people to do that at some point, mm -hmm. but I do think it is it's really helpful just to be able to say, I just want to talk about how I'm feeling or the frustration I'm having. I don't need you to fix the problem. I don't need there to be a solution at the end of the conversation. I just want to kind of talk through where I'm at. And I do think that for the person receiving that information, it could really make them feel like less stress because they're not trying to like listen and come up with something that's going to kind of fix everything. So I, I love the idea of prefacing it, talking about what you need before you even start the conversation. Um, I think that's also really important if you're wanting to have an in-depth conversation to ask the person that you're talking to, are you in a place to have that conversation? Do you have the time? Do you have the attention? You know, are you feeling like that's something that you can engage in? One of the things that I think um, has also come up for besides this idea of like getting unsolicited advice is this idea of judgment. So being a little wary of sharing things because the person listening might be having some kind of reaction or judgment. So what role do you think that plays in communication? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Mm -hmm. the, the question of what that is? Basically like, what would you recommend for people who are concerned about having a conversation with someone and receiving judgment from that person. Yeah, this is, um, so going into a conversation with someone that you share a special relationship with, it's very different from someone that you just walk by on the street. This person knows you more. They know, they know more patterns about you. They know more background um, when it comes to you. And also there might be other engagements of how they feel towards you at any given time or how the relationship is going. So for example, if the relationship isn't going quite well, there might, someone might be more prone to offer more judgments towards you. Uh, if the relationship is going well, that could probably be more reserved. Um, it's an offhand way, people say like passive aggressive. So it's an offhand way to um, try to get at a person or push a person's buttons um, for that kind of thing. So th that's, I think that's kind of off topic to what you're saying, but it, it fits in with um, how you're doing in the relationship and how things are going and, and how that judgment comes across. So if things are going well, and well doesn't mean perfect, it just means that, you know, things are going well. If things are going well, then there's usually less judgment in something that happens or less judgment that comes up. If a person is feeling judged, this, it also goes into like the background for the person who might be coming across as judgy, because that just might, sarcasm might just be a part of how they relate to people. And so if they come across sarcastic, it could come across as judgment. And so that has to be something that needs to be a topic of conversation or something that's worked out because it works for some people and it doesn't work for others. And if it doesn't work for you and you're in the relationship with this person, then it would probably be a good idea to bring that up and talk about it a little bit. Absolutely. I think that for relationships that have had maybe like a recent or per even a pervasive history of someone feeling like the relationship doesn't have as much positivity in it as they need it to have, or there's been a lot of negative interaction, sometimes some of that judgment can come more as like a tone, a volume, a facial expression. And I think that can be really challenging when you're having the feedback of like, I feel like I'm really judged by you, but the actual content of what you're saying, you've been very careful about selecting the, the right words, the most like affirming words, but you're still getting the feedback about, you know, the look, the tone, like what would you recommend yeah. for, for that? That 
it's hard to, to encapsulate that into what would work for everyone or what everyone should be aware of. So I'll take it from this tack. When, when it comes to the content of what you're saying, you could be very clear on exactly what you mean by what you're saying. If it doesn't match what you actually want to say to the person, then there's going to be a miscommunication. There's going to be misunderstandings. So for instance, it could be like um, the take out the trash example. Um, could you please take out the trash? Now, if I say it in that way, uh, my content or what I'm saying to you is basically take out the trash. That's what I'm asking you to do. If I say to you, can you take out the trash? There's more inflections, there's different parts of that. So with that, it, it goes more into what else is happening, what else is going on. And that underlying command that I'm, I'm sending out to you with that tone has a different meaning to it. It could be that, okay, I'm sick and tired of this happening every day. I feel like with this, you disrespect me because I'm doing everything else in this relationship and this is the only thing that you have to do. So yeah, there, there's a lot of things that might go on with that. So it's hard to like narrow it down to what it exactly is, but that would be an example of that content versus command kind of thing. Absolutely. So I think that, you know, it's important for people to also recognize that when there's been a history of, you know, difficult interactions between two people, that sometimes you get kind of wary of the next interaction and you might actually end up lumping a neutral, like there wasn't meant to be any kind of uh, like emotion to it, whether positive right. or negative, you might end up right. lumping that neutral into the negative, actually, because you're just like so on the defense about what the next comment is going to be. And even for sometimes, you know, if it's been a really complex, you know, interaction between the two, you might lump something that was meant to be slightly positive into the negative category. That's just what we do as humans. Mm -hmm. We kind of predict the next pattern. And if that's what's happening, it's really important. We talked about this during the taking breaks episode to step back and ask yourself if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling triggered in this moment to kind of take that break, do the deep breather, come back to the situation. And that way you can see whether or not the comment was really meant to be a neutral or a negative. That could be really helpful. One of the things that we've talked about before um, is kind of this idea of being curious. I know that like when we talk about it in couples training and we work with couples, we're like, you know, always be curious about what your partner's saying. And it's not necessarily because we want you just to like constantly be asking them and why and what's that about? But we want you to be curious about like what the intention could be behind it, what the meaning could be behind it, and not just to kind of make these presumptive ideas about what it is. When people do that, sometimes they communicate in a way that is guiding people to the answer that they want. And so sometimes they'll ask questions. So for example, uh, one of the ways that we embed answers within questions, which definitely impacts people's communication, is if I were to say, you know, Dr. Kaino Kariakua, you don't like pineapples, right? So I've already automatically given you the answer. I've given you some like body language to let you know what the answer should be. Can you talk a little bit about how we kind of steer clear of embedding these answers within the questions that we ask? Yeah, so, okay. Curiosity is a wonderful thing for everyone in general. In relationships, it's magic because curiosity allows you to be open to new experiences, to novel things. And novel things are part of what makes a relationship continue to be special. Because it, if it stagnates into something that becomes routine, some people it works for them. Routine is great. Um, for most people, for most, most couples, there needs to be something that is uh, new and fresh. So curiosity is a wonderful attribute to have in a relationship. The, the uh, very close to, but not so great, um, connect, connected part is um, suspicion. Mm. So if I am suspicious of what's going on with you and what's happening with you, I come to you with suspicion. So for instance, curiosity would be if my partner goes and does an activity with um, their friends and I ask them about like what they did, in curiosity, I would say, so how did it go? Where did you folks end up going to? Um, did you have a good time? Was there anything that happened that really stood out for you that was really fun? So that's curiosity because I, I just, I want to know and I want to share with that type of thing. Suspicion is, so 
who showed up? Who was there? Was so-and-so there? How come you spent so long? Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you text? So suspicion is leads into that investigation type, I think, that you were talking about, leading someone into feeding, giving you information or telling you something because they are suspicious of your activities and what you've been doing. Um, so sorry, I went into those two things and I totally forgot what the question was. No, no, that's perfect because I think that you're right. The curiosity is the healthy part of the coin and then we flip it and then we have suspicion. And suspicion makes it extraordinarily difficult to maintain and build trust in relationships because even if you're not doing the thing that you may be accused of or they may be talking about, it still makes you feel you know, there's a negative interaction because of the lack of trust there. So that absolutely is so important to talk about this opposite side of the coin. The point we were talking about um, after that was this idea of embedding answers into the questions by saying, mm -hmm. you know, you don't like pineapples, do you? And then like putting that into that. And I think that, you know, that's just a very light example. But when we talk about it in terms of relationships, in terms of interactions, that it has such so much more of a profound impact because what we're saying is things like, you don't want, and then there's a need in there somewhere, do you, right? And, and the person who's having to then answer doesn't really, they're not going to feel hurt because they already know what the answer is supposed to be, no matter like what it is. Like, you don't want to go spend time with your parents this weekend, do you? Well, if that person did want to do that. Now they already kind of like assume the person's answer is that they don't want to, that their answer should be that they don't want to, but they're also not going to feel hurt no matter what comes next. So what are some recommendations that you might have if people find themselves kind of in that pattern of embedding answers within questions? I think that right there is um, a good indication if they're finding it. If a person, if that's their natural way that they question things or that they do things, if their intent is that, I don't want to show up to your mom's birthday party, so I don't want to go. And therefore I say, you know what, we're really busy tomorrow. You don't think we should go, right? So mm -hmm. if that is a natural way that you do things, that it might be harder to identify it, that that's what's going on, that that's what you're doing. If you can, if you do find out that I'm asking these, these questions in this way because I want to make sure that you agree with me, that I'm whatever I'm needing and I'm wanting that I get from this. If I can identify that, then, you know, is that the way that I want things to happen? Now, I have had people tell me that, yes, I feel that I am right most of the time. So I want to let my partner know that because I am right, that they should agree with me. And so if, if that works for a couple, as strange as it may be to some people, then that works for them. If it does not work for a couple, if this is coming out to be something that is a problem and both, or at least one, probably the other partner is gonna identify that, you know, this is the way you ask questions and I feel I don't have any other answer but to agree with you, then that is a problem. And it goes beyond opinion. I, I know that last week I said, everyone can have their own opinion they're not gonna agree on everything. But this goes beyond opinion because it becomes an action, it becomes something that you're actually doing. So it's not just thoughts or anything else or belief systems that you know you have and hold dear to yourself. This is something that you're engaging into with your partner and you know manipulating the outcome to be in your favor. And that is not looking to listen to what the other person has to say that is, okay, you listen to me. So it goes back to that thing I said about speech. It's one way and whatever you have to say, I'm not really interested in because I'm just here to tell you mm. what I'm here to tell you. I think that's like such an important place to kind of like highlight this skill is this idea of creating a space. So if you're having a conversation with someone and you're thinking about the next thing that you want to say, you're not actually creating a space. You're just putting things on pause until it's your turn again. And we all get to those places. We're like all human. We're like, oh, I'm going to have this little witty, witty comeback, or I'm going to put this point out. But I think it's really crucial to ask like, what what's the end game for that? You know, when we talk about this win-win scenario, um, if that's the way I'm thinking, then it already doesn't feel like there could be a win-win scenario. And couples do communicate differently. So I love that you pointed out that for some couples, having questions with embedded answers really doesn't impact them negatively. That's how they communicate. It's still very healthy and they're able to kind of move forward. I think where it can be concerning is when 
one person doesn't feel like their opinion's validated, they don't feel listened to, especially if the, if the embedded answer is something like, you're not hurt, are you? You're not angry at me, are you? And those are like emotionally content questions that have the embed in it. That's a really difficult place to be in terms of having those communications. So I think it, you know, it's such a crucial thing to kind of highlight that every relationship's different, all communication styles are different, but just like checking in with your partner or your family member, or even, you know, your child and asking like, do you feel hurt? Is there another way that we could talk about it, which would make me understand your point more and just creating the open space with curiosity, with no judgment, and without giving advice you know if someone asks for advice perfect give it to them if they don't then you don't you know we don't you know overshare because then it closes down the opportunity to be able to hear more and share more i, I wanted to nice. um very quickly like insert yeah. with that and add on when it comes to the capacity of a person so if mm -hmm. i am embedding those responses for my partner and i'm saying especially the one that you said that you're not hurt, right? Because if I don't have the capacity to sit with hurt or to sit with my partner being sad, then of course I do not want to sit with it. And therefore I put in that, that thing of you're not sad. Tell me you're not sad. I don't want sadness here. So that is definitely a thing that would cause some issues in a relationship. Well, you know, I don't want to say that is for sure a thing because everybody's different. Everybody has their own way of relating. Uh, however, if you are in a partnership where you feel that you don't feel close to a partner or you don't feel like you can share emotionally with someone uh, and this is happening, they're, they're telling you not to be sad or not to be mad or not to be all these different things, then the capacity of that person to be able to sit with those things may be very shallow, may be very small. And it might not be that they don't want to be able to do it. It's probably in the moment or probably for however they are as a person, they don't know how to work with it. They don't know how to sit with sadness. They don't know how to sit with these different things. And people can learn to do that. It's, it's something that a process that takes a while, but it can be done. Absolutely. I think that one of the, one of the books that I read that really kind of changed my outlook on things was emotional intelligence. I thought it was a, a brilliant way of approaching kind of looking at the different ways that we learn. So we often think about IQ and how we learn things that concretely in school or out of books. But this idea of emotional intelligence of being able to be you know, empathic with other people to communicate about our emotions, to be able to respond in a really healthy way that we learn that throughout childhood. We learn that from people who take care of us as we grow up, our first relationships. And there may be people who are struggling with emotional intelligence that, you know, are just not where we would expect them to be. And we're asking them to do things that they're not yet capable of doing. But I love that you highlighted the idea that like, we can all learn it. We can all continue to grow that aspect of ourselves and get those things that maybe we didn't get when we were younger. We do have that book, Emotional Intelligence, as a recommendation for Image Age Book Club on Facebook. So if you're interested in following up, that is there. I do recommend it. I've read it myself. It's a great book. Um, thank you so much for joining us this week, Dr. Kainoa Kaniakua. Next week, we're going to be talking about mind reading. I think that comes up quite a lot in relationships. So if you're interested, please join us in our four-part series to the relationship skills, which will be next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.